Welcome to the DNX Podcast. My name is Sylvia Christman, and I am your host. I'm here today with my friend Dave Williams from NomadX, and I'm so excited that you could be here today and talk to us about entrepreneurship in the digital age. Hi, Dave. How are you? Hey, great, Sylvia. How are you doing? Really, really well. Tell me, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm in uh, Chamonix in France. Beautiful. And uh, how long have you been there and how long will you stay there? Okay. Well, we arrived, uh, my wife and I and uh, my dog, we arrived at uh, the beginning of January. I think it was like January 5th. And we're staying until March 26th. Beautiful. Beautiful. I am here in Tulum and I always, I'm always curious to hear where are my fellow nomads and what are they doing and how long do they stay in places? Because I think a lot of people listening always want to figure out how do you live nomadically and what does it really mean to be an entrepreneur in the digital age so dave tell me what are your thoughts on this mm, well it's a it's sort of an evolving question i guess but mm -hmm. i've been in the i've been an entrepreneur in the digital age really since uh, 96 97 so for about the past 20 years um, and when i first got started uh, based in atlanta georgia i started a digital agency focused on search and mm -hmm. uh, that was primarily based out of atlanta um, and then the next couple we had an exit, started a new company up in uh, New York City called Blink Media, a social media company. Mm -hmm. We exited that. So um, it was interesting, just the kind of evolution of working in the digital space. But now, um, after the last company, my wife and I have been traveling for the last five years, since uh, 2013, and uh, recently moved to Portugal in uh, June of this last year to start our new company, Nomad X. Um, and mm -hmm. right now, I'm in Chamonix, as I mentioned before. But... Um, traveling periodically, kind of a slow mad, I guess, as you'd like to call it, but typically yeah. I like to stay for a month or two months at a location just to get settled in, get a, get, start feeling like a local. And then as soon as I feel that way, I start to move again. <laughs> yes, I can identify with that. I, I, I think about staying places about a month or two. And then after about six weeks, I start getting itchy feet and I start thinking about where I want to go next. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah, we've been that way, kind of having those experiences for the last, you know, for four or five years. And it's just been a lot of fun and met a lot of cool people. And yeah. now we're even starting to return to places and reconnect with people we might have met four or five years ago. Yeah, so I think a lot of us do that, right? We're all, all slow mads. We, we do go to places where we know people. We hang out with other digital nomads because there's, a, there's sort of that consistency of working it's co-working, co-living, you know, having that idea of escaping cities and going into different um, countries and cities and experience different things together. So tell me more about Nomad X. What is that? What is it? And, and what do you guys do? Uh, it's, a, it's a company started uh, almost a year ago. Uh, but really, as I was going about doing my travels and just seeing the kind of ease of working really anywhere throughout the world, and having run into some digital nomads, uh, we had this idea of starting a company just to allow people to easily um, live in different places around the world with other digital nomads, um, getting connected into co work places, and then also being very connected into the local social scene. So uh, we, we launched the company in Lisbon this last year because we really see Lisbon as kind of a headquarters for digital nomads in Europe uh, to prove out the concept. Uh, we launched a program this summer for a couple months. Um, inviting nomads in. It was more of a remote work, kind of uh, unsettled type program. Um, and we did, it was good. And we kind of realized that it was, uh, you know, the market was a little bit different than we initially anticipated. I guess it was a little bit older. Um, and we saw a lot of friction in the process where, you know, nomads were really looking for very sort of inexpensive solutions on the living and the working scenario. Um, and whereas we saw, I guess, kind of reading about it from the States, you kind of see remote year and unsettled in these companies as, you know, the ones that everyone's talking about, but realizing they're just kind of marketing more to the premium nomads that are out there or to the work um, or to their, or to their uh, workplaces as a solution. Um, and so what we've done is we've evolved the solution to now where we're, we've created an open marketplace for people to easily find co-living housing situations all throughout Portugal, be able to match up with roommates, um, offering this to individuals at a rate that's anywhere from 300 to say 800 euros a month for living. So very reasonable in local areas, uh, making the right connections with roommates. And then also catering to uh, teams and also companies. So we're actually hosting a big company in May, 110 employees in Lisbon for a month, uh, where it's a company based out of the States and they're bringing the whole company 
to Lisbon uh, for a week. And then they're going to allow their employees to continue and stay because they're all, it's like 70% of them are remote workers anyway. So we really wanted, we're launching the business in Lisbon kind of with the idea of really getting it set up there, making it easy for people to connect with social events, um, everything's going on and really get a good knowledge of what's going on throughout the community, but then ultimately launching the business in different places throughout the world and Europe. Um, and just making it very simple and inexpensive and affordable for nomads to have these experience, shared experiences, right? Um, what they're looking for. So we found it's typically difficult for them to find the housing. They're typically going to Airbnbs, or they might be going mm-hmm. to more university-style housing. Mm-hmm. They're paying more of a premium because a lot of these solutions are more geared towards short-term housing right. solutions. So what we're yeah. really looking at is more mid-term housing for a month to six-month long stays. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like for the slow mads, I like that word for the slow mads. Exactly. You have a month or two. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Cause Airbnb is great for like one week, two weeks days, but you know, you know, renting a house for one or two months, that's sort of, it's, it's, it's a whole other market in there, a bit harder to find. Um, you know, I'm, I'm even here in Tulum. I just hired a real estate agent just to be like, okay, I just need a place for two months, you know, and she never, right. she never even heard of that. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's like uh, it's kind of a market that's unserved. That's it's not really serviced right now by any of the major mm-hmm. companies. Yeah, and people are having to find places on Facebook, or they're having to kind of rent Airbnbs at a premium. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's taking them a little bit of time to find these places when they land. So instead of kind of rocking into a new city and having a place to stay for two months, yeah. you're spending a week or two in an Airbnb and then scrambling trying to find a new place. Yeah, you just want to make it very simple to connect with the roommate, also find yeah. a cut co-living, co-working, and all the social events and activities are going on. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, 100%. I agree. That's great. That's such a good idea. I also think that, you know, you don't want to rent a room from someone who's not nomadic because they don't understand the lifestyle and then expectations get often, you know, very difficult. And a lot of these co-work, co-living spaces that are popping up everywhere, they have stipulations of having to rent a minimum of six months, you know, which we don't do also. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. exactly. That's not what we do at all. We're a month to month sort of situation and without the flexibility, it's just not really interesting. Yeah. So tell me, what do you, what do you mean when you think summiting the peaks of entrepreneurship? What does that mean to you? Um, well, you know, I've been an entrepreneur in the, in the digital age, as I call it, uh, really since uh, for, launched my first company in uh, 1998. Uh, which mm-hmm. is a company called 360i. Um, and we grew the company through the dot-com period, kind of survived the fallout back in 2000, 2001, and then exited um, and then started another company, Blink Media, which I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. We started that one back in uh, 2008, exited in 2013. So I really see it as kind of the evolution of starting a company to selling a company to transitioning the company through an acquisition and then coming down from that peak as well, because a lot of times getting up to the peak stuff, but then the aftermath of sort of regrouping and getting yourself on track can be sort of just as challenging. So what does it mean once you've exited a company and now you've got to reinvent yourself again? So I'm kind of on my third reinvention, I would say. Um, but yeah, I like to refer to it that way just because it's the the tragedy of the, the summit and uh, the people you start with may not always be the people you end up with mm-hmm. at the top and then on the right. way down the same thing. So right. it just, it, it's as I've kind of gone about my travels, I like hiking and I like, you know, I've climbed uh, Kilimanjaro and I've done some various kind of ex, you know, expeditions, different things. And I've just found that to be a good uh, analogy for the entrepreneurial lifestyle in this digital age, because everything changes so quickly too. Yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Everything changes so, so quickly. And it is kind of, it is an exciting journey, but it's also an emotional journey, right? The peaks Definitely. and valleys of entrepreneurship are, you know, intense, actually. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. I think that's, you know, a lot of people you read about entrepreneurship and all you hear is the, are the positive things or even you talk to entrepreneurs and they tell you everything's great. But mm-hmm. if you really kind of dig under the surface, you realize you know, in one day you could have a peak in the valley and yeah. it's an emotional journey. And so as, as I say, it's like riding a roller coaster. You have to like, the highs and you have to like the lows yeah. just part of the journey but it is oh, yeah. it can be uh you know it for some people it's too much for them you know, for other people that like the highs and the lows and they get used to it it's it can be a lot of fun mm-hmm. yeah i actually think i i thrive on that i i it excites me but i also know that it can easily burn people out when when I mean, they're not used to it and that mind the certainty and the uncertainty and being able to navigate that emotional landscape 
is something you either love or it's rather destructive, you know? Um, I, I, I teach this workshop called the art of failing forward. And it's so interesting. And the reason I came up with this was because, you know, growing, getting, growing up in the digital age of uh, entrepreneurship and the tech environment, you know, you, you learn about VC investment funds, but also know that, you know, 98% of them fail, but nobody talks about it. Everybody talks about the 2% that make it. Right. Right. Totally. <laughs> and I thought, you know, like, there's a, can, can we talk about what happens when you fail? We, um, we actually ran with, in collaboration with, um, with Ali watch this, um, really nice, um, analysis of, second, third, and fourth generation entrepreneurship within the New York City ecosystem, where you can clearly say that, see that um, entrepreneurs that failed in the first generation then succeeded in the second or the third on a different venture. You know, so it's a really interesting landscape to actually evaluate, but it's very clear that most of them actually failed twice, you know, sometimes three times before they hit a success. And, right. and people don't talk about it and don't talk about what, it, what, what kind of emotional fortitude and mindsets th- are required to, you know, make it across these peaks and valleys. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we always refer to it as uh, back in the early days of the dot-com period, which I guess a lot of the younger generation <laughs> didn't have the chance to experience. But we, my partner and my business partner and I used to call it dodging icebergs. We felt like we were on the Titanic and just looking out for the next iceberg that was gonna we were gonna collide with because it's just you know that's just kind of the uh, the nature of entrepreneurship is just constantly trying to evolve the business and then dodge these icebergs and uh, you know something obviously you're gonna make mistakes but try to do things that aren't gonna sink the ship kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> so i mean you're always failing is kind of the reality of entrepreneurship it's just how big are the failures right yeah i mean i i think uh, you know the the path to success is actually built with little bricks of failure you know it's just knowing that is what gets you to success i don't think pe- you know success isn't linear and people don't get there by doing it all right they're just very fast at pivoting and understanding and overcoming these obstacles and understanding how to leverage failure and you know strategic sort of problem solving and creative problem solving when mistakes were made that can make you that get you to success and allow you to move forward quickly don't you think definitely definitely i like to refer to it as it's it's more about survival than it is success. <laughs> so I think ultimately, if you can just survive, you know, the last man standing usually wins. So <laughs> that's been my path, at least. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. Mine too, actually. Yeah, for right. it's like, well, you got to have stamina and you just have, to have <laughs> persistence and perseverance. And, you know, like, so you got to be able to brush that stuff off and just, like, keep going, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not, it's not usually that pretty, but, you know, it's worked, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like there's there's nothing wrong with being a shameless opportunist either. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I'm more of a, a bootstrapped entrepreneur. So the companies I've started have all been self-funded or yeah. companies I've kind of worked on and grown organically, which is different than kind of the VC path where you're just flooded with money. So you have to be scrappy and sort of identify opportunities and yeah. focus on niches where you know, yeah. we think they're the bigger yeah. opportunities and the big players aren't, mm-hmm. aren't focused on as much. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It, it is definitely a very different approach. Um, you also don't have somebody, you don't also have people hovering over your shoulder, evaluating and judging every move that you make, you know? Right. You yeah. Get that's to the way be, I, yeah. yeah you get much to be prefer the that. Leader, yeah. You get to be the leader you want to be, right. You don't have somebody telling you who are supposed to be. So um, right. talk to me about adventure travel. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, I've actually, it's interesting. I've, uh, well, my wife and I, my wife is, uh, she's originally from Peru. She's mm-hmm. kind of helps me. We, we work together in these businesses. She's more, I call her a CFO for chief fund officer. So she's <laughs> kind of make sure all the employees are happy and the clients are having a good time. Uh, but she's really an adventurer. And so I guess as a part of, after we got married, we, we've done a lot of different trips, whether it's here in Chamonix, hiking the Tour de Mont Blanc, or it's climbing mm. Kilimanjaro, or biking through Vietnam. We've done sort of a lot of it, different adventures, or mm-hmm. you know, obviously Machu Picchu and the Galapagos. And I just like going on these great adventures because I think it allows me to disconnect and mm-hmm. sort of digest. And um, you know, almost like you were talking about before, a you know, digital detox, or even just a, a detox of your mind, where you're able to kind of mm-hmm. get away from things. And all of a sudden, things start to make a lot more sense. And when you come back to the office, you feel actually refreshed. Oh my God. A hundred percent. See, I'm a big fan of adventure travel. I'm an adventurer. I've, 
you know, I, I, I find great joy in living dangerously, you know, and I, uh, I also understand that not everybody wants to come along on adventures with me and that sometimes it's very unsettling for people to travel with me because my ideas of things, just the other day, you know, I ride my bike around everywhere and I had a friend visiting and, and she's like, I'm not really comfortable riding my bike around in dark places where I can't see anything in the middle of the night. And I was like, oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Dirt right now. Not your thing. Okay. Yeah. But to me, that's like, I love the open road. I love adventure. I love the, I love nature. You know, I picked up kiting last year and there's some, I'm in, you know, I, I, I'm in, I'm an adrenaline seeker anyway. And I think there's something about the combination, especially when you're an entrepreneur in the digital age to unplug, get away from places. Either there's no reception, you leave it at home or you intentionally do that to come together with other people to connect on a different level. Or, you know, you're, 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 you know, on an adventure somewhere experiencing and, and sort of the combination with, you know, it's not exercise. What is it? Like, it's not an extreme sport per se. Well, technically kiting is an extreme sport and hiking Definitely. is an extreme sport and skiing, right? Like, so that combination of, you know, a sporting event combined or, or something that's adventurous and, you know, it's also an achievement, right? When I, when I finally got to stay on the board starting kiting, that just felt like such an achievement. So when you hike up Kilimanjaro, I'm sure it felt like a massive achievement. Definitely. I mean, that's one of the main reasons, you know, my wife and I, we went on these trips that have been traveling for a long time. And one of the places we came to was here in Chamonix. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really see it almost as like, you know, one of the key destinations for the adventure capital of the world. I mean, you see people flying off the mountains with their kite, with their wingsuits. And, and you mm -hmm. have the uh, glaciers where you go skiing down the, the Ballet Blanche, which is one of the longest ungroomed mm -hmm. runs in the world, where you come mm -hmm. down a, actually a, a summit from the Gilda Midi. Um, or even just, you know, we've done some heli boarding while we've been here, and even just some snowshoeing adventures to huts in Italy and here in France. Um, really, really fun. So I, I love the adventure of it. You know, I'm not looking to kill myself by any means, right. um, but I like the idea of getting away from things and then coming back and just yeah. being able to sort of hang out with people that are even more adventurous than me in many ways. <laughs> and I feel like that gives me the uh, confidence in myself and entrepreneurship and everything else, where everything else just seems easy in comparison. <laughs> Hundred percent. I know. I mean, I just learning how to kite, and for me, just to like be able to go upwind and downwind and stay on the board and like make like a mini jump. You know, I felt like a major accomplishment. And then around me, everybody's doing all these like super loops and going crazy. And you know, just being around that is completely inspiring to me. And I'm, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go all the way that direction. But being around people that are doing something where you can learn a new skill set, a new sport a new a new something you know it's exciting to me and if you do it in nature in that context especially because i have such love for entrepreneurship it's just a perfect combination and i find that a lot of digital nomads you know flock to these environments because you know we're, we're busy doing cool stuff you know and pushing we're pushing the envelope right like we're pushing um you know we're, we're pushing ourselves whether that's physically or mentally emotionally um, and definitely professionally where we're pushing the envelope to see like, what are the new things that we can create or try out? Definitely. I feel like, yeah, that's the, you know, the big thing with this digital nomad lifestyle is, you know, it's getting out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, starting a new business, my first business, I started in Atlanta, the second business we launched in New York city, this next business we're launching in Lisbon. So it just, the idea of even going someplace new, starting something new, going on these adventures mm -hmm. and trying to kind of package it all together and to holistically, you know, who you are, or push yourself to the limits and, and just meeting interesting people that are doing different things. Yeah. And, and they're there not because they want to talk about work or to talk mm -hmm. about business. They're there for their love of nature and their yeah. love for adventure. <laughs> hundred percent. Oh, hundred percent. I love it. Yeah. I completely understand. So if you, if you were to talk to someone and someone is listening to this podcast, that's thinking, oh my God, I really, I really, really want to try this. What's your number one advice you would give them? Um, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, and like you said, I think the best thing is to go out and try new things, to try and learn new skills, you know, whether it's you never thought you'd go scuba diving, learn how to go scuba diving. You know, if you never thought you'd go snowboarding, go out just for a week and learn how to snowboard. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I've found is that some of the things that I thought I didn't like, you know, in my younger years, um, 
when I was just getting started. Um, nowadays, those are some of my most favorite things. So if you tried things before and you didn't like them, I, mean, I think it's always good to circle back and try them again because you have a different perspective. So I think the most important thing is just to try new things, meet new people, get out of your comfort zone. And as a result of that, you're going to be a better entrepreneur, better person, and uh, more diverse, bringing those skill sets together. Yeah, 100%. That's great. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I'm so excited about this. And for anyone listening, we're going to post all of the information about Nomad X and their plans and events uh, and ways to get involved below this podcast. Thank you so much for making awesome. the time. Thank you. Hey, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Great Take to care. talk to you today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your ongoing support. Before I leave you, I want to invite you into my world. Please go check out dnxcommunity.com. This is where you'll find the other nomads and evaders of convention. We'll see you there. And if you're interested in our English speaking events, go and check out dnxglobal.com. You'll find the link below this podcast as well. And if you have time, one last favor, please go to iTunes, look for Sylvia Christman or look for the DNX podcast and leave a review. Thank you so much, lovely people. And I'll talk to you next time.